Good morning. Giving honor to God, the author and finisher of my faith, to the beloved angel of this house, who God has made queen for such a time as this. And the fierce solidarity and support of her austere ministerial team to my pulpit associates. These singers of Zion that have blessed us this morning, members and friends, I, along with my family, my beloved husband, Dr. Juan Floyd Thomas of 25 years, and the sweetest fruit of our love and labor, our daughter, Lillian Nikeda, and my aunt Lorraine, who is one of Selma's fiercest community organizers, who's just laid her husband to rest and had the roof of her home torn from the Selma tornado, and my lifelong friends from Vassar College, who made a special trip to be with me today. We greet you, my fellow workers in Christ, for your presence, but more importantly, for your perseverance. Truly, this is a day that the Lord hath made, not only because we've been graced with it, but because it was a day that was not promised. A day where the elders used to say in Corpus Christi, Texas, where I grew up, it's good to be seen and not viewed. <laughs> we have become them. So let us rejoice and be glad in it as we now go to the throne of grace. Dear God, this is once again your child asking for you to use me and mold me according to your will. Send a seraphim with a coal from your altar to sear and seal my lips so the words I say may be approved in your sight. Let the word that goes forth be as fire in our hearts as wood so we will be consumed with understanding as we are commissioned to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you and your word. And those who can say, say amen. In her classic novel, Their Eyes Are Watching God, celebrated author and patron saint of womanist thought, Zora Neale Hurston reminds us, there are years that ask questions and years that answer. Hurston's words speak to our souls today. For in this brand new year of 2023, we are inundated by auspicious anniversaries rooted in the life and legacy of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. On the one hand, this year marks the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington and the landmark speech that King gave that day in which he heralded for all the whole world to hear, I have a dream, a dream that refused to be trampled underfoot in the red clay dirt of Georgia and Alabama. On the other hand, this year is also the 55th anniversary of King's assassination in Memphis, where he had the holy boldness to stand in solidarity with black sanitation workers who had the audacity to insist that they were humans, even as they made their living disposing of trash. Separated as we are, by so many decades, we now have countless volumes filling up library shelves worldwide, desperately trying to find a deeper understanding and greater relevance to those two biographic pinpoints of King's eventful, yet all too brief life. Much like Herson's musing suggests, how does the interplay of time and opportunity combine so that we can ever truly make meaning out of these often bittersweet and bewildering things we call memories. When we take the occasion of this King holiday to commemorate the life of possibly the most influential and important faith leader this nation has ever produced, does it make sense to focus on his highest heights, such as a sunlit August day where this truth he spoke loudly and proudly before God and everyone at the National Mall? 
without also processing the pain and loss we all suffered as a people, a nation, and even a world, when only a few days later, he also experienced his lowest low as he was slain by a gunman on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel for the crime and misdemeanor of being a voice for the voiceless. Much like the tumultuous era that King and his compatriots lived through, we also find ourselves in perilous and peculiar times as well. Without provocation, all of us recall the global, global COVID-19 pandemic that engulfed all of humanity in 2020 with little hope in sight. The pandemic that forced us to stay at home, to be seated at the table with only our family and glued to a television set where we couldn't turn a blind eye to the police killings of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. There's a fierce urgency to find answers to the questions that these events pose. The death-dealing ravages of COVID-19 alongside the deadening blows of police violence and political unrest have created an unrelenting search for clarity and certainty amid the increasing complexity of the world around us. The truth of the matter is we can neither survive nor flourish if many of these questions remain unresolved and the lessons to be drawn from these all-consuming crises go unlearned. And we, not merely as collaborators, community organizers, or citizens trying to negotiate a world miscolored and marred that judges character and competence along the racist continuum of honorary whiteness and dishonorable blackness, but as children of God, we, the body of Christ, the church, we must take seriously my woman and sister, Kelly Brown Douglas, who tells us to ask ourselves, what's faith got to do with it? We often quote the pithy profundity of Hebrews 11 and 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Yet this badge and brand of our religious platform rarely takes note of the fact that there, in this verse, and perhaps in our incarnation of it, faith and lies share an epistemic root. Lies that present themselves as fear-mongering, that is false evidence appearing real, is also the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Likewise, the adage, hindsight is 2020, is a hopeful sentiment rather than an established truth. Soren Kierkegaard's theological inflection on this aphorism extols that life can only be understood backwards, but we are called to live it forward. Predicated on a never-ending future, it presupposes the privileged position that we're always moving ahead in a logical and linear manner with the added benefit that time is always on our side. This perspective denotes the opportunities afforded to someone who routinely has the luxury of reflecting upon time gone by to chart one's future. Yet what about those who must incessantly look back and peripherally process as they are compelled to move forward in real time, particularly in times of devastation, despair, and distress? And even more so, as Columbia University professor Sadia Hartman thoughtfully posits, how might we understand mourning when the event has yet to end? Truly, we are exacerbated with our mourning and the enormous toll it has taken on so many lives. We realize for those on the margins of society with their backs against the wall, faith from hindsight does not simply refer to living from one's past, but also living with one's past in such a way as to gain immediate insight that is crucial for instantaneous foresight. There is much to be said about engaging the troubles of our current era while also enduring them. 
So here, in this place, where we have not just been mourning for 30 days as they did for Moses, we have been mourning for decades. We have been mourning for years. We realize that we need to double down on that tender and tendentious human endeavor called hope. As I stand in this glorious house of worship, nestled here in New York City, I can recall how more than 20 years ago, the terrible and tragic events of one autumn morning retains a singularly solemn importance as both physical and psychic in that it scarred upon us and this city in such a way it scarred us that it left an indelible impact upon our communal memory. In downtown Manhattan, the names of nearly 3,000 people are enshrined in bronze as part of the 9-11 memorial. And on the One World Trade Center now stands within the entire footprint of where the Twin Towers once stood is now part of a great national place of remembrance. In those spaces, we not only remember the deceased, but also the surviving family, some nearly 6,000 loved ones of partners, parents, and children who died that fateful Tuesday morning in September. We must be ever more mindful of how 9-11 terror attacks lit the spark of full-fledged military conflicts to eliminate the Taliban in Afghanistan and uncover non-existent weapons of mass destruction in Iraq as part of our so-called global war on terror. Despite Dr. King's prophetic warning in his Beyond Vietnam sermon uttered in this very same sanctuary over five decades ago about a nation, our nation, addicted to its imperialistic ambitions to the detriment of its poorest, most underserved citizens, the United States fought the decade-long wars that were overseen by four U.S. presidents, Republican and Democrat alike, only to still find ourselves back in a world full of threats and lies. To put this into starkest comparison, since the global COVID-19 pandemic began, we have seen 9-11's worth of fatalities virtually every week, and we're reeling from it. Even still, the coronavirus is mutating. It is evolving more than our faith and our consciousness, and people are dying because of it. And yet, where we once remembered the dead and dying and paid homage to them, all that many of us want to do now is forget and forsake them. And still again, for those of us who survived the so-called summer of racial reckoning in 2020, how much of anger, anxiety, and animus of that historic moment still remains at the core of our collective consciousness. Without the passage of federal and state level legislation, such as the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act of 2021, we are still waiting for social reforms beyond scrubbing racial stereotypes from sports team logos and grocery store items. Somehow, we now find ourselves in a post Roe versus Wade American society, which is startling not only because the U.S. Supreme Court decision was settled law, star Ray de Sayes, which might have been highly contested, but was overturned by at least four conservative SCOTUS justices who swore they would never overturn it. Until they did. We've also dealt with climate-based catastrophes with greater meteorites, with greater frequency and increased potency. We have scourges ranging from mile-wide meteorites to massive wildfires, to monkeypox, to murderous hornets. Do you all remember <laughs> the murderous hornets? 
all as a part of the universe, letting us know fully that we are not in charge of anything. This moment in time demonstrates how deep solidarity coupled with a compassion critique rooted in the best virtues and values bestowed by religious imperatives can help us bring our country into better view. Several critical insights have emerged because of much of what my brother scholar Michael Eric Dyson calls the syndemic of virus and violence and what it has revealed about the United States. Now, some lessons are crystal clear, while others might be somewhat more obscure, as exemplified by the way citizens who typically went largely unnoticed and undervalued suddenly came into focus as essential workers. Are we happy that that nurse's strike is over? Essential workers risking their lives during the crisis to help fellow Americans stay alive and to keep the entire nation moving forward. But there are many other lessons once overlooked that are now starting to come into sharper focus as they are now determined to be essential in more than name only. So is our faith essential? If we dare to save souls without losing hope, heart, minds, and yes, lives in the process. Arguably, what fueled Dr. King's faith was, what faith was a resolved optimism based on his belief in God's guiding hand in the work of human history and the eventual, real, eventual realization of social progress in America based on confronting the trials and travails of a flawed and fragile democracy. King demonstrates that this, this most clearly when he contends that people have, and I quote, the capacity do, to do right as well as wrong. And our history is a path upward, he said, not downward. The past is strewn with the ruins of the empires of tyranny, and each is a monument not merely to humanity's blunders, but to our capacity to overcome them. This is why, he says, I remain an optimist, though I am also a realist about the barriers before us. Why is the issue of equality still so far from the solution of America? a nation that professes itself to be democratic, inventive, and hospitable to new ideas, richly productive and awesomely powerful. The problem is so tenacious because despite its virtues and attributes, America is, King says, deeply racist. And its democracy is flawed both economically and socially. Justice for black people cannot be achieved without radical changes in the structure of our society exposing evils that are rooted deeply in the whole structure of our society. It reveals systemic rather than superficial flaws and suggests that radical reconstruction of society itself is the real issue to be faced. It is time we stop, King says, our blind lip service to the guarantees of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These fine sentiments are embodied in the Declaration of Independence. But that document was always a declaration of intent rather than of reality, unquote. Now, much like the road to hell is paved with good intentions, the road to fascism and tyranny is paved with people telling you there's nothing to worry about because it's not as bad as you think. Whether rumors a la the late Donald Rumsfeld would have us believe that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence, or the alternative facts that promote and protect the most unqualified person in United States history to name and claim the presidency of the United States by beating out the most qualified person in U.S. history. the most qualified person in U.S. history who also won the majority popular vote. Here, we must humbly admit to ourselves that the political norms and socio-political institutions we once thought were foolproof actually have proven that, in fact, we have been fooled. There's clearly a reason that Merriam-Webster proclaimed gaslighting the word of the year in 2022. It's no bit of a 
exaggeration to state that our cherished nation, nation is lurching much closer than ever before to Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale than toward Martin Luther King Jr.'s beloved community. I cannot, and more importantly, I will not accept that the opportunities and options for my daughter will be worse rather than better than any I have had or much less than the life chances and choices of my mother or grandmother. I stand resolutely in my faith, firmly believing that to do so is more to move in the exact opposite direction, away from God and God's will for our lives. It is to raise more hell than to bring heaven down to earth. To be clear, the reason why it's not politically correct to talk about race religion, economics, and politics is because small talk keeps us majoring in the minor while fueling the fire of incorrect politics. That's why many folks on the right do not want us to talk about hope, because they are afraid and unwilling to do what it takes to make the world a better place for everybody. The attack on critical race theory should be a crime itself affirming myths as history by assaulting academic freedom ensures the closing of our minds when scholars and teachers are not judged on the merits of knowledge, but how well they appease powerful political interests of tyrants who sanction sin and censor truth. Wisdom cries out in the streets and common sense begs the question, how are schools and students expected to observe holidays like King Day, Juneteenth and Thanksgiving. Yet we censor teachers from teaching about what these days really are. How these days really came to be and why it matters as a part of U.S. history in order to form a more perfect and not a biased union so we can establish justice and ensure domestic tranquility for everyone. Nevertheless, like Dr. King, I held from that distinctly Southern branch of the Black Baptist tradition that loudly and proudly proclaims in the idiomatic verse of the King James Bible, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Our perennial struggle as human beings, both individually and collectively, is to make that arduous journey from relentless tears and mourning during the dark night of the soul towards the abundant joy and laughter that greets the morning sunrise of a new day. The frustration of our faith is akin to Paul's sensibility in 1 Corinthians 13 and 12 of seeing through a glass darkly, in that we are searching for God through a looking glass because we cannot trust our own sight. Paul's letter to the Christian church of Corinth is not specifically, specifically simply poetic for him, but it gave the corrective insight that seeing doesn't always lead to believing. If anyone knew this fact, it should have been the man formerly known as Saul of Tarsus, but it's often when we can't really rely on our own worldview or eyesight in life's journey that the glory of God is truly seen. Oh, so much so that it blinds us to how we once saw the world and opens up a whole new second sight, wherein, as Henry David Thoreau insightfully said, it's not what you look at that matters. It's what you see by faith. Our Hebrews epistle lesson shows us that just as those cloud of witnesses were our saintly ancestors, we too are children of their wildest dreams and answered prayers. So too, hope is a parent of faith. Conversely, hope that does not breed faith is fruitless. Those saints, from Moses to Martin, from Hagar to Harriet, from the Canaanites to Coffin, Cone and Canaan, from the Hebrew slaves in the wilderness to those enslaved in the Middle Passage, from the immigrants who made their way to Ellis Island over 100 years ago, to the migrants and refugees who have risked their life and limb to make their way to the U.S.-Mexico border, 
to the yearning activists and protesters to peacefully transform dictatorships into democracies, whether they were in Iran, Russia, China, Peru, or even here in the United States. Hope is the seed from whence every move towards a truly humane world grows and flourishes. All these saints were commended for their faith, but did not receive what was promised, except us. And without us, their work and their witness will not be made whole. Listen. Listen closely with your heart's ear. Can you hear them calling out to us this morning? A morning they were denied and where we are left behind covered in their hope. Can't you hear their hope as they holler out to us? You come out of your morning. Face the rising sun of a new day begun because only you, as we, only you will die once. So wisely choose to live life every day. It is more than just written. It is enfleshed in reality that here in this sanctuary, on holy ground, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, known and unknown. In fact, I invite you to no longer mourn their death, but to choose ye this day that their death will not be a moment of despair, but it's their life that you will celebrate. Even right here now in this sacred space, break the silence, call out the names of those who loved you, loved justice, loved the beloved community so fiercely that their love still lives. Call them. Call them out by name. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is the silence that we give to sin. And the power of sin is a law that abides by unjust law. But thanks be to God through the gift of Jesus Christ, who was slain before the world, that same God gives us victory today. Let us not merely hope, but claim that love triumphs over evil. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely as we run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus as the pioneer, paragon, and perfecter of our faith, let us spiritually and kinetically be the kingdom of God's goodness that cannot be unshaken. In so doing, we must not wait. There's a fierce urgency of now, and now is the time that we must bend that moral arc of the universe towards justice. Because if we don't bend it, it won't give way. In his Testament of Hope, published after his death, King summarized his interrelated thoughts on social justice issues, such as racism, anti-racism, equal rights, nonviolence, global peace, and progressive values. In these posthumous comments, he reminds us that despite all the pain, uncertainty, suffering, and loss he experienced at the forefront of the civil rights movement, he was still an optimist. I think it's befitting that those words were published after he died so we can hear him and keep the faith. He said, and I quote, people are often surprised to learn that I am an optimist. They know how often I have been jailed, how frequently the, how frequently the days and nights have been filled with frustration and sorrow, how bitter and dangerous are my adversaries. They expect these experiences to hearten me into a grim and desperate man. They fail, however, to perceive the sense of affirmation generated by the challenge of embracing struggle and surmounting obstacles, unquote. So too, let us no longer find catharsis in the complacency of our mourning, making mountains out of strongholds of monstrous mediocrity or the menacing mole hills of microaggressions. Quoting and singing Ella songs last Sunday, Pastor Thorne reminded us that we who believe in freedom cannot rest. 
That means we must come out of our favorite hiding places within ivy halls and stained glass walls lined with pews of piety or pity or corporate rooms and high posts of privilege. We cannot bask in the arrogance of innocence. Likewise, those of us who have been marginalized with our backs against the wall, shut out, cut off, and told or showed that our lives don't matter. We can no longer wait to be affirmed or emancipated. We can no longer bend to the condition of our oppression, making the vice of patience in the face of persecution a virtue. For as King stated elsewhere, there is a fierce urgency of now that insists we can no longer wait for injustice and oppression to just fade away. And we who believe in freedom cannot rest. And that impatience should have already begun. We must work the work of the one who sent us while we are still shrouded by night sky. Because once the time is right, we must be ready, willing, and able to place our face towards the rising sun of a new day begun. And as I close, let us shed the paralysis of analysis that has been our modern day sackcloth of ashes. And instead, let us like Angela Davis, no longer accept the things we cannot change by changing the things we must never accept. Let us give thanks. Let us give thanks by paying it forward. Let's offer to God an acceptable work of our wor worship of our work with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire that blazes a trail by which we prepare from our mountaintops a promised land and a promise of a new day, morning by morning. Amen.